Today's episode of Datages is devoted to Jorge. I don't even know Jorge's last name, but I can tell you this episode would not have happened without him. Why? Stick around and find out. Welcome back to Datages, friends and family. Who is Jorge, and why is he so important to this episode of Datages? Well, those of you watching Datages on YouTube can see clearly that we are not in the Datages studio today. This is another edition of Datages on the Road. In fact, this is Datages Overseas. I'm recording today's episode from Warsaw, Poland. Those of you that follow Datages closely know that I'm expanding my real estate development business to Poland and Central Europe. So, when I arrived at the airport, back home in Dallas, it struck me like a ton of bricks as soon as I got out of the car. I left my power cord for my Microsoft Surface at home on my desk. Those of you that know the Surface know that it operates on a proprietary power adapter that can only be purchased from Microsoft. I had no time to go home to get mine. There was no Microsoft store at any airport where I was going, and there is no Microsoft store here in Warsaw. Trying to have an adapter shipped to me likely would have led to it arriving on the last day of my week trip in Poland. This episode of Datages and my entire trip could have been compromised. If you've listened to Datages for a while, you know a few things about me. One, I generally have faith in the goodness of people. Two, I never box myself in when looking for creative solutions to problems. And three, I value money only as a tool toward achieving objectives. So, when I got through security in Dallas, I went to the American Airlines Lounge. I walked slowly around the entire lounge, examining each table, looking for someone who was working on a Microsoft Surface. That's where I found Jorge. I approached him, asked him if he was headed home or headed out on a business trip, and to my relief, he said he was on his way home. Excellent, I said. I have an odd proposition for you. I explained my predicament and offered him $200 to purchase his power adapter on the spot. It turns out Jorge had not just one, but two Surface power adapters. I'm telling you, Jorge is a superhero. After recovering from a bit of shock at the nature of my proposition, he said, I have an adapter for you, but your price is $200 too high. Jorge was willing to give it to me for free. I was grateful for his generosity, but honestly not shocked. As I said, I think people are generally good. And if you present yourself to them openly and honestly with a human to human request, I think you'll usually get a pretty positive outcome. I negotiated with Jorge and persuaded him to at least accept $50 from me, which is approximately the cost of the power adapter in the store. Did I mention this wasn't the first time I'd forgotten my adapter and had to procure one? Unfortunately, I'm well aware of Microsoft's pricing practices. So here we are. Thanks to Jorge, I've had a very productive week in Warsaw, and I'm fully empowered to produce this episode and to honor the interview date and time that we established with today's guest. So with gratitude to Jorge, Let's pick up there with today's special episode of Datages Overseas. Today, we're focusing on one of our first datages and my father Mark's favorite datage, To Thine Own Self Be True. And I'm really excited to welcome to the Datages Virtual Studio and to introduce to all of you today, special guest, Ed Center. Ed is the founder of Village Well Parenting, a community where parents go to learn skills that nurture the parent-child relationship heal intergenerational wounds, and discover the wisdom that allows parents to remain culturally grounded. Village Well helps parents embrace and share the beauty of their own cultural traditions without passing along their trauma. Ed has spent his career supporting low-income, underrepresented youth, and adults by helping them gain access to the resources necessary to thrive, working as a success strategist through youth programs, nonprofits, and schools. Ed, a very warm welcome to Datages. We're so glad you're here. It's so great to be here. And I'm thrilled that you focused on that dadage to thine own self be true, because I think a lot in my own life and in my kids' lives about authenticity and how one discovers that and how it's not something that we stumble into and hold. It's something that we're constantly figuring out over our lifetime. That's amazing. And it's such a great fit. I, I am so glad that this is our topic today. And I think it's going to be great for the Datages friends and family to get their piece of being true to themselves today. And Ed, we'll get into the great work you do in a minute. But mm -hmm. first, I want to remind the Datages friends and family of a disclaimer that I provided all the way back in the very first episode of Datages, 
in my household and in the Dadages friends and family by extension, political correctness is not embraced as a virtue. <laughs> <laughs> that has always meant for us is that we don't hide our differences. We embrace them and we talk about them openly and unabashedly. I know that today is going to be one of those episodes where we create a safe place and we talk directly about differences in culture, heritage, race, sexuality, and other topics that are considered sensitive in much of our culture. Now we've provided fair warning to those who may be easily offended. They can hit pause right now and go check out the next episode of Datages. But for the brave of heart, here we are. We love exploring differences in the realest way possible. And we're not trying to piss anybody off. So with that, let's dig in. Those are great guidelines. <laughs> yes. I've explored your community online. Much of your content and a lot of, I've seen a lot of really positive feedback from people who've participated in your programs. And I get the sense that as we were talking about, you also embrace the importance of acknowledging and talking openly about our differences in human beings. My takeaway is that doing so is pretty fundamental to your community that you've established. Tell me if you agree with that notion and, and tell us about your diverse community at Village Well Parenting. Yeah, I mean, it's the real reason why I got into the parenting coaching, parenting education, parenting support business. I had been an educator for a long time and worked with families. And then at a point where, uh, so I have two kids. Uh, my husband and I have adopted two kids through foster care, two sons. We call ourselves the house of eight balls. So Fantastic. there's your political correctness right there. I can right do that there. math. Yeah, I can do that. <laughs> yes. What I found is I needed some support, particularly when things got really difficult, as they did mm -hmm. for lots of families during the pandemic, right? Mm -hmm. That I needed some extra support for my own parenting. And so when I went out to find that support, I found some great tools, some great literature, some very smart people offering that support, but it didn't fully resonate with me for a couple reasons. One, there was this, I think, unaware, implicit assumption, if you will, of whiteness and middle upper classness, right? Mm -hmm. So references to my kids can wake up anytime they want, but they can't come downstairs until seven o'clock because that's my alone time, right? Uh, and so there's yeah. a bunch of assumptions up in there. And then I found myself as somebody, so I am Filipino and so is mm -hmm. my husband, and that some of our cultural traditions felt like they, or, or, or styles of raising our kids felt like they were under attack, if you will, in these parenting models. And so I wanted to figure out a way that one, I could hold those traditions, right? While learning about parenting tools. And then the second piece was, and this is so critical, in order to access any tool, any practice around positive parenting, you need to do the hardest thing in the world in parenting, which is to stay calm when your kid is not, right? Which is all the time for the first, what, 18 years? <laughs> right, exactly, exactly. Just the early and, period. <laughs> right, and I, I found that particularly with one of my kiddos, when things were really hard, I would just fly off the handle and lose my shit all the time. It's and so, so easy to be I, reactive, yeah. It's so easy to be reactive and that that's related to, you know, my own childhood and, and generations going back. And so yeah. what I had to do was focus on figuring out non how to not react in those situations, which is what we call healing, right? And that Absolutely. is deep yeah. work and hard work, and it's hard the right work. work. Yeah. And so that's what I've really brought into working with the Village Well community, focusing on our multiculturalism, on our diverse backgrounds, all are welcome, and that we have a healing journey to go on in order to show up best for kiddos and ourselves. That's great. And is that, you use the term positive parenting, is that the definition of positive parenting? I think positive parenting is a broad term and positive parenting really looks at how you support positive behavior from your kids without leaning into threatening, punishment, dominating as your primary tactics. 
right? Yeah. And so how you lead with connection and support and bringing your kids along. And I found that there's a lot of good in that that I could really relate to. And I found that there was some stuff that just didn't work for me and wasn't working for some of my clients as well. And so to figure out how to create a more open bucket that doesn't really look at good and bad practices, but how do we move forward in a loving way? What does that mean for you and your family? And what's effective for both you and your kids? Well, as you said, effective for you and your kids, not for everyone and everyone's kids, because Correct. everyone is so unique. And let's talk about that a little bit. Let's yeah. talk identity and how important that is to your community, your message and the work you do. And I want to talk about kind of a difficult subject and a unique distinction, which mm -hmm. is the difference between labels versus identifiers. And I think that in general, we as human beings don't like to be labeled. It's a narrowing. It really is a narrow minded uh, perspective on individuals because labels lead to limitations. But in today's world, especially with the next generation coming up, Gen Z, and I think a lot of this is driven by social media and how much it plays a role in their lives. Finding community is really critical to finding fulfillment and belonging. And one of the ways that that's done is through a really growingly intricate and specific series of identifiers that we can apply to ourselves. And how we identify is so important, as I said, in, in today's day and age. And I loved when I saw what your TikTok username is, which is at Queer Brown Dad. Yes. And as someone who has not only found a community, but you've actually built one, can you help us understand what your identifiers say about you and about your community and also what they don't say, where they don't complete the story of Ed Center as a person. So one of the reasons why I chose that is that I want my queerness and the makeup of my family to be front and center in my work with all parents. Because if you're a person who doesn't resonate with those identifiers, right, if yeah. that may prevent you from doing quality work on your own family, then I'm not the right person or community for you. Ah, yeah, right? Se self-selecting proposition. 100%. And so that is part of it. I think there's also something restorative maybe is the right word. So when you look back at many indigenous histories, right? Mm -hmm. Queer folks were often seen as teachers, healers, people who were able to traverse multiple worlds because of mm. identification with multiple genders. Yeah. And so we're often seen as mediators, marriage counselors, etc. Mm -hmm. right? And then that was lost through colonialization, mm. uh, yeah. colonization, excuse me, and kind of the repression of LGBTQ community right. over time. Right. So that to me is about going back and reclaiming power that may have mm. been generationally associated with queer folks and then trying yeah. to bring it in. Most of my clients, most of the people in my community are in male-female relationships or they're single moms or single dads, but most of them do not identify as queer. And so I want to create a space where all are welcome, but also that people know what they're getting into. Yeah, it's such an amazing perspective. Thank you for sharing that, that bridging role and that force that you bring to the table with that heritage going back generations of, of the queer population and that role that they played. I loved what you said about recapturing all of that. That's really remarkable. And, and this is where I want to connect on a personal level, because I mentioned to you ahead of the interview, we aren't that many steps removed from one another, surprisingly. Yes, but you uh, haven't I'm, told me how, so I'm waiting. Right. Like and, and I'm a straight white dad. <laughs> You're a queer brown dad. So where's yes. the connection? The connection point is that my wife is an exotic flower herself. She is half Filipina and half Lebanese. She was raised in a family that was very much focused on what you were talking about, that cultural definition, artistry, communication, music. She is the niece of Kula Desma and okay. comes from an incredibly artistic storytelling family. There was a point in time in her life where, as I said, her parents were from different countries, lived in mm -hmm. different parts of the world for much of her youth. She was actually growing up during her formative years in Manila with her two uncles. And her oh, two wow. uncles were her biological uncle and his male partner. She had the exposure to that growing up, and it has very much framed her perspective on the world. One of the things that she says is 
and I told her that I was having this interview with you. And one of the things she told me specifically, she wanted me to share is that she was so thankful when she was growing up that her uncles did not hide their gayness from her. They exposed her to their lifestyle, who they were, what they were proud of about themselves. And it has allowed her to connect with that community. And today we're, as you said, many as most families are, we are a straight couple raising children together. Many of our closest friends are gay couples and gay friends that have the same types of experiences that you talk about in your, in your community. And so she is exceptionally thankful for that heritage. And I'm exceptionally thankful that she has brought that heritage into my life as well. Thank you so much for sharing that. My first reaction was, it sounds like your wife should be interviewing me rather than you. Yes. But then I get, I guess it wouldn't be dadages if that was the case. It would be yes. <laughs> yeah, yes. I have so many questions, which we'll save for a time when we're having dinner. Sure. Absolutely. About what Filipino and Lebanese culture coming together feels like. It's not a model that I know. Yeah. It doesn't necessarily come together easily. Uh, yeah. A lot of conflict bet. and confrontation, especially when you consider that within all of that picture, you have Catholicism and Islam as well coming together. So it's a very interesting mix and not one that is always copacetic. I also, I so appreciate the story about uh, your wife's uncles. And it reminds me that it's important to recognize, right? I, many people feel like gays having kids or queer folks having kids is a new phenomenon, right? And definitely in the visible culture, right? right. It right. is in, in many mainstream, ways, right? Yeah. Yes, and the acknowledgement of that. And I I think that's a positive thing. And queer folks have been raising nephews and nieces for mm -hmm. millennia, right? right and right. it might be actual nephews and nieces, it might be chosen nephews and nieces, but this field, and I think it's called biological anthropology, if I get mm -hmm. it right. And one of the hypotheses about why homosexual behavior shows up across so many different species is that it may be advantageous to have a subset of the species not reproduce on their own and channel mm. their energies towards the well-being of the population, which wow. in humans can look like, oh, my sister's having a hard time. I'm yeah. going to take her kids for a month a year, five years, whatever it is, while my sister works on getting her act together. And yeah. you see that in all cultures, in all places, queer folks who have shown up for their community, even yeah. in their churches, even in their mosques, et cetera, et cetera, to help raise kids. And um, so it's a tradition that my husband and I, when we mm -hmm. decided to have kids, we decided to go the foster adopt route because we knew about that tradition. And also as an educator, I I knew that I could love other people's kids. And so, and that there were a lot of kids out there who needed support. And so that's why we chose that route as well. What an amazing thing to have that insight into yourself to be able to recognize that and have that guide your decision making. That's fantastic. You said my wife should be the one interviewing you. She did have one question that she said yes. she really wanted me to earnestly address with you. And it's something that she has spent time thinking about because that what you described is exactly what her situation was. Her nuclear family structure was rough and kind of fell apart. And she had her uncles to step in and, and raise her for a time period and provide this amazing experience to her. She has spent a lot of time thinking to herself, though, what if that was the only model I had of parenting? If I were a child growing up in a household where all I was ever exposed to was the relationship between my uncles, how do I, as a straight individual, as a child in that scenario, evolve and develop my own identity, whatever that may end up being, if I model that as, as straight or queer later in my life? And she said, her question was, is there a necessity when you are are a same-sex couple of finding ways to expose your children to other heterosexual couples as well to model the alternatives that exist that the rest of us consider mainstream, but is not right. what your children grow up with. That's such a great question. And the answer is no, because we live in a mainstream society. Right? right. And so even though my husband and I are obviously queer and mm -hmm. we are in a queer family, if you will, we move through the same schools, the same so many kid birthday parties, 
six-year-old soccer games where I want to pull my hair out because I'm a yeah. soccer aficionado and <laughs> they're not doing anything interesting on that soccer field, right? And so we move through life. And also I want to name that we are in San Francisco. So we're in a very accepting bubble, right? right. And we've never right. faced any discrimination based on our queerness. We've certainly encountered right. some a-holes in our lives, right? Of <laughs> that we all do. do with... Yes, yes. And so most of my kids friends parents are a man and a woman or a single mom and and so we roll through that and so the role models are out there we've also been very blessed that our families so both of our parents uh, the kids grandparents as well as biological aunties and uncles love them and are a huge part of their lives and so they're exposed to many many heterosexual relationships and families the difference for my kids what i do see is that instead of the traditional kind of coming out story where one either is straight and that's normal or is not and then goes through a coming out process, my kids have the buffet in front of them, right? And so they get to decide at some point. And I've seen particularly my older kiddo who's 12 dabbling in both, crushes in multiple directions, talking about pairing up uh, in the future with people of different genders. And I have a great story related to that. I, at one point, yeah. I think he was in fourth grade. I said, when you grow up, do you think you'll want to settle down with a man or a woman? And he said, I don't know. And he said, well, maybe a man, because if I marry my friend Griffin, then we could play video games all day long and no one will tell us what to do. And I said, if you think marriage is about no one telling you what to do, you're in for a lifetime of heartache, buddy. Absolutely. <laughs> right? Whether he comes out as straight or gay, there's a lot of lessons to learn right there, yes, I guess. Yes, I also say the trickier part with many adoptive families is exposing your kids and giving them grounded knowledge in their cultural background. Mm -hmm. Right. And so if you are, let's say, a Asian family who has adopted Latino kid, how do you support them in that in understanding mm -hmm. elements of their yeah. Mexican yeah. or El Salvadorian culture yeah. that you may not have uh, full access to in your life? And that's and an unlike issue to think sexuality, about. as you described, where heterosexuality is available and accessible in the mainstream, yes. those subtle cultural differences may not be. Correct. And Very so that's where where F, where you need to put in effort. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, and, and let's focus on the generational piece too, because one of the things that we really focus on broadly here at Datages is the transfer of knowledge and wisdom that happens from one generation to the next. What you've really opened my eyes to and a lot of the materials I've seen within your community is that another thing that could be transferred from generation to generation is trauma. And particularly, it seems, as you've described for immigrant families, there is an intergenerational trauma that can really be passed along, sometimes unknowingly. Can you describe exactly what intergenerational trauma means and what impact it can have? So I often talk about it in an immigrant context because that's my context, but it can yeah. definitely happen in families that have been in the United States for a long time of mm -hmm. any ethnicity. Mm -hmm. And so what I see when I work with particularly folks of color as my parent clients, everyone wants to hold on to certain elements of their culture and pass mm. them down to their kids, right? And that goes beyond people of color as well, right? But I see this course, as an especially course. strong focus in folks yeah. of color. And so for me and my family, that means that elements in my culture are cousins as your first best friends. Sunday suppers was a big thing in my household. I'm gay, so I flipped it to brunch. There um, you go. That's, right? And so having community and extended community on a regular basis, it could be one of the things that was really important to my mom that's still important to me today is outdoor playtime as sacred space, right? So if wow. we, we were encouraged to get outside and yeah. if we were outside, we would never be asked to do a chore. We were given free range and free range. 
that's valuable to me as well. And I want to pass that on to my kids. And we live in an urban core. So that's tricky, right? How do we do that? Right. But those are core values that I want to pass on to my kids that come from my culture. I've also recognized over time that there are certain elements from the way I was raised that are toxic to me and that Mm. I want to interrupt, right? And so, for example, in my culture, we have a definition of respect for adults that is absolute, Mm -hmm. that cannot be questioned, and can move into a place of being toxic, right? And then that respect is often, it is enforced with strict punishment, domination, yelling, intimidation, threatening, et cetera, et cetera. Not only enforced, but from what I've seen secondhand, sometimes misplaced. You're forced to respect something that is not respectable. If you ask any parent, do you want your kid to grow up to be able to advocate for themselves? Do you Mm. want your kid to be able to negotiate? Do you want your kid to be able to set boundaries? Do Mm. you want your kid to be able to express when they're not comfortable with something? Like, of course we want those things. And so how do we then parent our kids in certain ways where that conversation is not available to them with the people that love them most in the world? And when my kid talks back to me, I have a surge of of anger that and want to dominate, suppress that conversation. And that comes, I realize, from my own uh, generational baggage, right? Mm-hmm. And the way that I was parented and the way that my mom was parented and the way that my grandparents were parented, right? And so the work now is to understand that when my child is talking back to me, that I am not actually physically threatened, that mm-hmm. I can do things, engage in practices to find that space between stimulus and response, right? Yes. And choose a different tool than the triggered desire to dominate. Working with parents to understand that that does not mean that you don't hold authority, but you learn to hold calm power and you learn to be able to acknowledge the need of your child while setting your own boundaries. So for example, Chad, I see that you're really upset right now. I get it. I really do. And you can never use those words with me. Okay. So we'll talk about that later. But right now, let's talk about how you really don't want to eat these carrots. And let's figure out a road forward through dinner. And then we'll talk about the words you used a little later, right? And so I'm holding my power, I'm holding my authority, but I'm not in a place where I'm trying to suppress you, dominate, intimidate, etc. And how do we find that space, right? A big difference that I see, and this is true for all parents, I think, is that most of us grew up being taught by our parents, and it's not universally true, but mostly that there are some emotions that are good and some emotions that are bad. And we are rewarded for the good emotions and we are punished or shamed for the bad emotions. And what I find is many modern or contemporary parents want to teach their kids that all emotions are valid, right? Including hate, rage, lust, and... Not all actions are appropriate. Right. Right. You have and to so recognize how do we recognize the emotion? Yes. You own the yes. emotion. Yes. You acknowledge it, but then you act through the logical mind, not through stimulus and response, as you said. Correct. And so as parents, that requires us to show up again with calm power and say, I see that. That's okay. That will not scare me. Right. Your rage will not scare me. And you can't call me the names you just called me. But that <laughs> conversation comes later when we're both calm. I'm curious, Chad, that frame about right and wrong emotions. Did you experience that growing up or did you have a different model with your parents? You know, I I really have to commend my parents. There was really nothing in my life. Emotions are one category within everything. I was taught that there's really nothing that's black and white. There's nothing that's right and wrong. I was really brought up to understand that every decision has consequences, both positive and negative. Every action has consequences, both positive and negative. And you should understand and evaluate what the positives and the negatives are and know the ramifications of your actions before you take the action. But I was never told you can't do something, you can't feel a certain way. I really think 
think that that's one of the most valuable things that my parents passed on to me and the way I was brought up. It's framed my perspective on my entire life across the board. That is incredibly valuable and beautiful. And it actually helps me understand a frame. Let me be clear. My parents, both of them were so loving, so caring, yeah. did so much. And particularly from my mom's side, everything was black and white. Mm -hmm. Like this was a good behavior or a bad behavior. You got a good grade. You got a bad grade. You committed to this thing or you didn't commit to those that thing, yeah. right? And all of those were taught in explicit terms. And I realized how much I've been unlearning that mm -hmm. now and trying to teach my kids in a different way. And that trait of your mother, that black and whiteness, do you feel that was an ingrained cultural trait or was that just a personality trait for her as an individual? I think it was definitely an ingrained cultural trait. And I yeah. want to be clear about this. I don't think it was necessarily that something that all Filipinos in Hawaii hold. But I do think one of the things that I have learned and studied in more recent years. So we have this beautiful immigrant story, as many families do, of mm -hmm. my grandparents moving from the Philippines to Hawaii in the early 1900s to work the pineapple plantations in Hawaii. And so pineapple is a big part of my family history. I'm a snob about pineapple. It's got to so be perfect. you don't perfect. eat from the can. I do not. And I am definitely anti-pineapple pizza and throwing a ring of pineapple on a burger and calling it a Maui burger. Like that is just not okay. In I think way. the greatest travesty <laughs> to Hawaiian heritage is that they labeled that pizza Hawaiian pizza. <laughs> yes. <laughs> across the board. Well, that and the, you know, overthrow of the monarchy. Um, yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> There's that too. Um, yeah. There's that too. We have this, you know, story of my parents, grandparents coming and the hard work and industriousness and thrift and, you know, saving up pennies to buy land, then, you know, developed houses on and were able to have property and help their kids move into a middle class life through the military and education, which afforded me, the third generation, you know, an easier life. And this story is told as a story of loyalty and resilience. Resilience. And mm. it was definitely told as you don't complain because everyone before you had it harder, right? Yeah, yeah. In studying my family and and really as a child, listening to my aunties and mom talk outside the kitchen when they thought I was reading, I would learn other aspects of our family story. Like my grandmother was a child bride and mm. didn't have agency in her marriage choice and then wow. had 10 kids and the last two almost killed her. And the last one was my mom. It was that on payday in the plantation villages that the men would take their wives and families into the sugarcane fields to hide because they were worried about the bachelors from the other villages getting drunk and coming into town to cowboy the women. I was an adult when I realized what cowboy meant. And that my grandpa participated in strikes that were broken up physically by goons, right? And so there was this violence that perpetuated, yeah. it was kind of the Wild West of Hawaii, if yeah, you will, Yeah, heavily right? physical violence, yeah. Yes, Incredible. and the threat of violence and the fear. And I think that seeped into their practices as black and white, right? Like yeah. everything was emergency and therefore you were home by dark. You yeah. could not walk to this place by yourself. You listened to your parents' rules all the time and you were punished strictly because of the sense of It was a matter fear. of survival, it sounds. Like. Yes. And living in fight flight all the time. Right. Yeah. And so yeah. now understanding how those practices have informed how my grandparents raised their kids, how my mom raised me and having compassion for that and understanding that I am not living in a wild west anymore and I can choose to offer my kids a different model than black, white, right, wrong, good emotions, bad emotions, and really look at allowing my 
kids as your parents wanted to, right? Mm -hmm. Like understanding choice and consequence and having some freedom to play with what that looked like. Yeah. I really appreciate you sharing those insights and amazing cultural stories. And when I compare that, my wife's upbringing and what she brought to our relationship, because I don't think these things are elements that we carry only to a role as a parent, but they're elements we carry to a role as a spouse and to a, as a partner. And she brought a lot of that same black and white perspective from her culture. And she brought a lot of that fight or flight, immediate stimulus response reaction that you're talking about. And those are things I call these the $10,000 issues because they're the ones that we've spent $10,000 a piece covering in couples therapy to resolve. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. That makes so much sense. And to bring it, you know, serious again, that your wife obviously had some traumatic times in her childhood, right? And as did her parents. And so how that leads to emergency thinking, if you will, and emergency acting, and then that stuff gets coded into us and shows up as adults. And so yeah. that's how we keep therapists employed and living large. Absolutely. And I, I believe that one of the most important things in a relationship between two partners is the opportunity to grow through a healing journey together. And I think that's one of the things that has been the strongest in our relationship is that we have confronted these things and we have worked through them. We have found common ground on the other side. And I think that's so important then when you can model that to your children, because you then show your children how to go through conflict resolution and pass those techniques and skills on to them. Yeah, I think that transparency and a studied transparency, right? We obviously mm -hmm. don't share everything with our kids. To model for our kids, yeah, there are hard times and we work on them, right? Versus models I saw from my parents, which was they never talked about it, but I heard them fighting. And so that, again, creates a sense of fear and instability, particularly when I never hear how the fight was mediated or how they made up or what agreements yeah, were you, made. You only experience that. the conflict. You don't experience yes. the resolution in that yes. scenario. Yeah, that's an interesting insight. And, you know, to continue with this important topic around trauma, there's not only parents that bring trauma generationally, but particularly when you talk about being in an adopted family, kids can bring trauma into the equation and into the family unit as well. Talk to us about what we need to understand in that equation about raising kids who have experienced big trauma before you even have a chance to meet them. This is such an important topic and yeah. obviously so relevant to my family, right? So we adopted both of our kids as infants. My kids are biological brothers. Okay. And um, so we adopted our first born six months old and then six months, excuse me, six years later, we had what I call an unplanned gay pregnancy, which is we got a phone call and they said, hey, we have this baby boy. He's six, six weeks old, blah, blah, blah. Are you interested? I said, like, why are you talking to me? And it was a social worker from the city and county of San Francisco. And then she said, oh, I forgot to say he's the biological brother of your Oh, did son. I leave that out? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I like screamed on the streets on my cell phone, but you know, people scream all the time on the streets in San it's Francisco. San Francisco, so no big deal. Not a big deal. Not a big deal. Yeah. So we met our second kid the next day and he moved in with us four days later. And so it was like, I, I had a conversation with my boss at the time. I said, so I'm pregnant and I'm very Pregnant. Very pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> right. So we had to figure all of that out. And we did. I think at the time, we knew that our kids would need extra support because they came from poverty. They were both premature. Birth mother and fathers had decided not to keep them and really couldn't. Right. And so we knew that our kids would need extra support, but we were under the illusion that love and care and commitment can solve it all. And that's only just, in a Disney movie. Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't true. And it's, yeah. it's not true. And what we now know is that early infancy trauma 
And my kids are lucky. They have not experienced abuse. But, you know, being in Niku for a long period of time, not being held all the time, a very different way of coming into the world than we're so excited you're here. We've been waiting for you. Yeah. We've been planning yeah. for you, right? That that creates incredible challenge because your brain is being wired at the time and your brain is wired in emergency. And yeah. so what I find with both of our kids is that their alarm instinct, their fight flight is on a hair trigger. Is that how we say this? Yeah, and absolutely. so Something happens that for you and me or neurotypical, a kid with a, a calmer entrance into the world would be a bummer, right? Mm. So no, you can't have a slushy. Oh, yeah. no, we can't find that toy, right? Oh, the play date you wanted is, we, you thought it was for today, it's actually for tomorrow. That can go into DEFCON 4 for my kids. Mm. Right. And so like yeah. screaming, throwing things we have had to learn is how to support our kids going when they go into that fight flight in a way that's very different from how I was threatened and suppressed when I did yeah. as a kid. Yeah. Cause I was also a big feeling impulsively behaving kid, yeah. even yeah. though I had a very calm entry into the world. Right. Yeah. But I wasn't at the level of my own kids. And so how to overcome the instinct that I have generationally to correct my kids behavior right away to one of understanding that they are in crisis mode, even though I see the reason for that crisis mode as being the stupidest thing I've ever experienced, right? Uh. That for me to be able to show up for them and say like, I get it, that is such a bummer. And through my own actions, show how one can stay calm and re-regulate yeah. in this time and then get to a place later where we can actually try to focus on the issue, make promises about getting a slushy tomorrow, uh. right? Or whatever the thing is, or can we offer you something that's healthier, right? whatever that thing is. But it's a very different approach to parenting. And it is not one that came naturally for me because of my background. It's something that I've had to learn. Yeah, I have to commend you tremendously. And it's the recipe for the perfect storm, it sounds like. When you take easily triggered individual because of a cultural heritage that ingrained that in you and surround you with hair triggers from your children, as you described, as I said, that's the potential for the perfect storm. But it also, to me, is the potential for tremendous growth. I mean, it sounds like you have been forced into personal growth in ways that very few individuals are forced to in the most fundamental part of your life, your family and your children has forced you to grow as an individual. It, it's really so, remarkable. Thank you for that. I would argue a different perspective. I think that you, you're right. It's the perfect storm. And I think that there are hundreds of thousands, if not millions of families in America that have that perfect storm, right? Mm -hmm. Parents who have experienced great hardships because of poverty, because yeah. of systemic issues and have kids that also have faced trauma. And so that volatile situation exists in families all across America. I am privileged is that I have educational capital, social capital, and a little bit of financial capital to be able to have taken on that journey for myself. And so I had tools and resources to figure out that I wasn't, that something was wrong and that I needed extra help to do so. And I could go find that help. And so a big part of my calling with the village well is how do we create that community for other families? And so I will say a little bit of my work is fee for service with individual families, coaching workshops, mm -hmm. et cetera. Mm -hmm. But the majority of my work I'm doing through government organizations, child welfare systems, school districts, nonprofits, so that we can reach families who don't have at least the financial Much resources. Systemic advocacy yes. versus just one on one. Yes. And then come in and work with those families and say, starting off with, I know parenting is hard, right? Yeah. I know life is hard. And here are some tools that are going to make it easier for you. And then from there, build trust so that we can talk about a healing journey for those families. Yeah. And that's yeah. where I think my most exciting work is happening right now.
That's amazing. And I'm a big fan of stoicism as a very important anchor in life. And Ryan Holiday wrote the book, The Obstacle is the Way. Very clear that you have embraced the obstacles that have been put in front of you as a way to create a very positive impact on yourself, your family, and the rest of the world around you. It's remarkable. I don't know what stoicism is. So if all your listeners do, we <laughs> I can look it up later. But do you want to give it in a nutshell? Sure. Stoicism is essentially that philosophy that the hardest things that we face in life are actually the opportunities for growth. The hardest oh. obstacles that we see in front of us are actually the opportunity for innovation and evolution to solve those obstacles and those challenges. And so it's a philosophy that is embracing those obstacles that come our way, the hardships, the challenges, by recognizing them as some of the most important forces in life to help us get to the other side and to help us grow and improve as individuals. Thank you for that language and framework, because that is 100% what I do, but yeah. hadn't thought about in those terms. So I always start off my workshops with parents. Think about this in a parenting context. What's the rock in your shoe right now? Yeah. Right. And let's bring that to the table. And that's where we can start learning because it's the thing that's relevant for you. And then we will, through that process of understanding that so much growth and awareness can open up. Beautiful. That's beautiful. I know that that message resonates effectively with your audience, because like I said, I've seen feedback from people as to how much they've been touched by that and how much they've been touched by your openness and what you share about your own life to help serve as a model for them. One of the topics that I know that you focus on at Village Well is also is you talked a bit earlier, you used the phrase neurotypical. There's the opposite of neurotypical is obviously neurodiverse. And there are family units and structures where you may be dealing with neurodiverse children. There's also instances where you have neurodiverse parents. And I know this is a topic that you cover and one that's important to you. Can you help us understand the dynamics of those situations and how it can creep into parenting and a parent-child relationship in a way that can be damaging? I am blessed in that both my older son and I have ADHD. Okay. And so ADHD and autism, the spe spectrum, if you will, are the most common identifiers of being neurodiverse. And in another podcast, we'll talk about me being an entrepreneur for the first time at 50 and discovering getting diagnosed for ADHD at the same time, because oh, that yeah, was a yeah. trip. But what that has allowed is as I have started to understand my brain and my kiddo's brain, it has allowed me to understand how both of our brains work and therefore have generous interpretations of very annoying behaviors, <laughs> right? So let me give you an example in terms of generational Please, healing. Yeah. My mother and I had the great towel wars of 1989. And okay. what that looks like was I I would wear a towel around my waist out of the shower, take it to my room and drop it on the floor. And then she would tell me to pick the towel up every single night and put it back in the bathroom. But because the bathroom seemed way too far away, I would put it in my hamper. And uh, what that led to was on laundry day, my mom discovering seven towels in the hamper and her interpretation of that as you don't respect me and my labor. Mm -hmm. You yeah. think that I am, you know, a slave in this house and you are doing this is an indicator of your lack of respect for me. Some of that may be true. I was a 17 year old narcissistic a-hole, if you will, as yeah. many 17 year olds are, right? My therapist said once every family has a shithead. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So I was claiming, I was grabbing the ring as shithead in my family. Yeah. What I now understand is that is classic ADHD behavior. Mm right? Yeah. The inability to process that learning because we're already on to the next new thing, mm -hmm. right? Somebody recently said folks with ADHD are constantly doing side tasks, right? And yeah. like our life is filled with side tasks. And so moving I was on, on to the next on rather thing. than following through. 
Correct. And so now every night, my older kiddo, who's 12, takes a shower. Well, he doesn't take a shower every night and he needs to. That's a different story. But when he (laughs) takes a shower, he leaves his clothes on the bathroom floor. And so every night I say, did you pick up your clothes? And then he'll go and clean up the bathroom. And then I'll say, and he'll say it's clean. And I say, go back and look through my eyes. And then he goes back and then fully cleans it. Right. And you know what they call that? Payback. (laughs) <laughs> uh, yes, I call it my mom's curse because she go. definitely, right? And because I am doing different type of work and because I understand neurodivergence, yes. I don't get mad about it, right? right? I right. understand that this is a journey and that I'm going to give it exactly how much energy it needs. And that the real goal for me is I want a clean bathroom and he doesn't care about it. And so I'm just going to get the clean bathroom and I'm not going to take any other energy or lessons or interpretation of it. And so that's a way that understanding neurodivergence in this case, particularly ADHD can be really helpful to parents because we yell at the ADHD all the time, we as parents in general, and it doesn't have to be an actual neurodivergence, right? It can be a quirk of your child that your four-year-old is just having trouble following more than two directions, right? And so let's not get angry. Let's build the skills to follow multiple directions. And that's a lot of the work I do with parents is seeing behavior shifts, not as taking what your kids are doing personally, but flexibility is a skill. Transitions are a skill. Listening to multiple directions is a skill. How do we build those with our kids? Embrace it and use it for a positive outcome. That's that's great. Yeah. How many adults do we know that struggle to listen to multiple directions at a time, right? So most. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Yes. There's so many amazing concepts that you cover within Village Well. We can't cover them all here, but there's one term that I really found fascinating. I had no idea what it meant, and I really would like you to explain it so that I can understand it and the rest of the friends and family can as well. You talked about decolonized parenting. What is that? And and why is that an important concept? I think that's a term that I have embraced and I'm still learning. So that caveat, and I alluded to it a little bit with queer history. I know that for all ethnicities everywhere, we had in our clans, in our tribes, in our villages, ways of raising our kids that were usually communal, Mm -hmm. that often allowed our children a lot of responsibility, but a lot of freedom as well. And through colonization, when Europeans saw different groups around the world as resource providers. It shifted and looked to the extraction of resources, including human resources, humans as resources, that it shifted our practices with our children. If you think about for African Americans who come from the slave trade, right, how family life was completely unstable, right? Or if we think about how villages in the Philippines, where I come from, were rounded up into labor and families broken up through Spanish colonization, that it had a big impact on the fight flight instinct of trying to keep our families together of the Mm -hmm. nervousness. I think that moves into what we talk about, like this black and white thinking, this desire to threaten, to cajole, to punish our kids because of some great fear of violence that may or may not be real. Decolonizing to me means pushing back on those practices and saying, I'm going to own my parenting, my family, my values in a way that makes sense for me. I'm going to look at how violence seeped into our cultures and family practices and work to remove that violence and instead hold calm power. I am going to create new villages, which is why my company is called The Village Well, because I think healing and child rearing and growth is always done in community. And so it's pushing back on these practices that have come in through colonization and reclaiming a space for freedom, if you will, within our families. Yeah, and it's it's reclaiming so much of human history too, because presumably all of those parenting techniques that you talked about come from all those different ethnic groups. They worked for generations and generations and generations. And then in one or a couple of generation period of time when the colonization was occurring, it was all just wiped out. It's uh, 
remarkable in terms of you used the word reclaiming earlier in, in this discussion. And I think that's a big part of it. Well, I'll name one that it, we are reclaiming now across the board in America. And it's a process. When you think about most of human history, there were so many different routes available to people to be successful in your career or role in the village as an adult, right? And so you could be an intellectual, you could be a, a student, but you could also be a carpenter or a farmer or warrior or mushroom gatherer, right? Each had its place and each was respected within the overall community. Yes. And then in American society and global society in many ways, in recent history, we've said everybody needs to go through the same educational system, learn the same yeah. things, graduate from high school at a minimum, and ideally go to college. Yeah. And so much of like our achievement gap problems for low-income kids, kids of color have been, you're not graduating from college, and therefore you're going to be poorer, less successful, et cetera, et cetera. We are now moving into to a space where many families are saying college is an option that might be great and there are other but it's not a guarantee of success and there are and it's other not options. for everyone for sure no no and so I have a kiddo who really struggles with academics. And one of the things that I'm really clear to him about is you should go to college if college is a clear pathway to something that you want to do. Other than that, there are so many different paths, right? He loves animals. So you want to be a veterinarian, go to college. You don't be a vet tech. Or he loves working with his hands, as many neurodiverse people do are often, I am an exception to that. I have no small motor <laughs> skills. What, what about career where he's using his hands? And those are all valid. And I think we're having a better conversation about that and why it's decolonization, right? Is it saying that this model has been placed on all of us? Let's push back and say that there's so many different paths to success that could benefit all of our children. You have such an amazing and nuanced lens, Ed. It's really beautiful the way that you look at things and the way that you've integrated that into everything you're doing at Village Well. You know, I want to thank you for being so open and, and transparent as well with everything that you've shared so far in this discussion today. And I know that one of the concepts that you talk about at Village Well that I think is really fundamental too is how we can develop as parents and particularly as dads, to be the dads that we need to be versus the dads that we had. Can you better explain to the dadages, friends and family and put in the context, please, of your own journey from the dad you had to becoming the dad that you need to be? From my own story, I had an inc have an incredible father. So he is from Boston mm -hmm. and he lost his father when he was 13 years old to a heart attack. And so being a dad was the most profound identifier that yeah. he took on in his life. And yeah. what that meant is that he was so kind, so loving, so present for us. Both my brother and I have stories about where we had to draw boundaries with our father. Like, no, you yeah. cannot come to all of these events. In accordance with culture at the time, he deferred all challenging parental duties such as discipline to my mother. Right? right. And so he got to show up as just the loving father. And I understand the cost that that had on my mom. Also see is that he suffered because of his commitment to be a father. He also suffered in his own well-being. So he started several businesses that were never successful. He also had health problems. What I see now is if he had diverted some of his time to health practices and working on his business, I also think he suffered from Depression and we didn't know at mm. the time. He might have no one had was a allowed to talk about it back then. Right. Particularly men. I see the cost. And so, what it's meant for me as a father is to strike a different balance, which mm -hmm. I'm not sure I'm getting right on any given day, but maybe yeah. I'm getting right over the course of time, which is I'm starting a business and I'm going to give it my best effort. And that means sometimes, even though it's a parenting business, that I'm not available for my kids. Right. 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 
And that means that I have a commitment to my own health practices, including mm -hmm. sleep, being contact in community, being connected to community. I'm seeking balance in a different way. And so yes. again, the, the through line here is I am taking things from my father, right? Yeah. I'm not a particularly patient person. My dad was, and I think about him when I am trying to be patient with my kids and my partner. And then there are things that I'm trying to change as well. And so I think that holds true for a lot of dads today. And what I really see common in the dads that I work with is so most of them are pulled in by their wives right? And yeah. then discover that there's something here. But the script around being a disciplinarian, around not taking any backtalk, around modeling hard work for kids mm -hmm. is really strong. And so it takes more time for me to support those dads to do it with intention. So you're not just like, yes, of course you want to teach your kid to work hard. And if your perfectionist child is screaming because they can't get the math problem right, maybe yeah. you want to take your foot off the gas for a little bit and come at it a different way another time right? Maybe yeah. this isn't a character building moment. Maybe this is a resentment building moment, right? <laughs> and so like understanding- it's a fine line, right? It's a very fine line and we all cross it. And so one thing I haven't talked about today is also the importance of fucking up and giving yourself grace, right? Because Absolutely. we do that a lot through our journeys as well. Yeah. If perfection is the only standard that's allowed, it will never be achieved because it doesn't exist. Yeah, I love on social media to tell stories about my screw ups and what I'm learning from them because I think it's important to model both parts, right? The willingness yeah. to screw up and the commitment to learning and course correction. So with all of those mistakes along the way and mistaking your way to growth, how have you had to grow, change, challenge your narrative about fatherhood in order to not be a crappy dad? key areas that you can point to, to say, these are the specific things that I've done as Ed that have worked for me. This is a small and subtle one, but I bet a lot of your listeners can relate to this, right? Mm -hmm. And so I'll be busy and maybe I'm doing work or maybe I'm having a rare moment of enjoyment on my own, reading my book or something, right? And my kid will reach out to me with something that they want to share with me or a request for my time. And we use a tennis metaphor, right? Serve and return. So my kid is serving and they're saying, come look at this thing. Look at this drawing. I'm in the bath and I blew a big bubble in my bubble bath. And what it's actually saying is, see me. I want to connect yeah. with you. What we want to do with our kids in that moment is return the serve as much as possible right? You can't always return the surf. My kid says, I'm blowing a bubble. And so then I come into the bathroom and say, wow, look at that bubble. That's amazing. Congratulations. And show them care and connection. We can't do it all the time. And what I found is when I am working, especially or busy, my kids will serve and I'll get really annoyed. Why are you bugging me? Why are you bugging me? Or maybe I'm yeah. mad at myself that I can't return the serve. I don't know what's going on, but I was being so yes. short and impatient, yeah. right? Yeah. Like, hey, dad, not now type of thing. Yeah. And what I've really worked to switch is if I can't return the serve to do it with compassion. And so, hey, dad, I'm busy right now. I want to hear what you have to say. Can you hold it? And I'll be there in... 10 minutes. I think all dads can relate to this. You're sitting on the toilet and your kid starts knocking on the door, right? And instead of saying, get the hell out of here, it's I'm on the toilet right now. I will be out in five minutes. Can you wait till then? Right. And so just bringing that with compassion so that I am communicating, yes, you are my number one priority in life and I cannot connect with you right now, but I wish I could and I will later. It sounds like your go-to piece of parenting advice is if you can't return the serve, at least don't throw your racket. <laughs> yes, particularly if you're sitting on the toilet. I don't know why that metaphor works, but let's go. <laughs> <laughs> toilet tennis. Yes. <laughs> New sport. Yes. yes. So th this has been a lot of fun, Ed. I really enjoyed the discussion. It's been very meaningful as well. And I want to make sure that if they're members of the Datages friends and family who want to learn more about you, want to connect, want to learn more about the village well, you have a lot of offerings out there. We'll certainly put posts on our bulletin board on 
www.thedatages.com with links to your website, yep. villagewellparenting.com, as well as some of your social media platforms. But can you just share a few examples of the programming and resources that you offer just so our group is aware of them? If you are Village Well curious, the best way to experience us is every first Friday, mm -hmm. we have a drop-in hangout session. Free first Fridays. Free first and Fridays. Yes. Right yeah. <laughs> it's only half an hour and I'll drop like one bit of content. So that on October 6th, we're going to be talking about nudging your kids towards healthy nutrition nutrition. And then we have a conversation about whatever people want to talk about. So it can be nutrition or whatever folks want. And then at 1230, we call it, but I stay on longer in case people want to have uh, more individualized discussions. And so that's a great way to meet folks in our community and test out what we do. I'll also say that I have a two-part uh, workshop series coming up. You can attend just one or you can attend, attend both together called Get Off That Damn Phone. Mm hmm every parent I know is struggling with yeah. safe and balanced screen time use with their kids. And so this is a way to look at what is healthy, figuring out how to establish good boundaries, learning our alternatives to babysitting your kids rather than having them on a screen. And not that I'm totally anti babysitting with a screen. Done it. Right, we'll right. do it again. But that is something that might be of interest to your listeners. That that one is a pay uh, workshop, but we'll give okay. folks 50% off if they use the code DATAGES um, at checkout on Eventbrite. Oh, thank you so much for that. That's incredibly generous. And I know that our friends and family really appreciate the opportunity to be included in that way. Like I said, Ed, I'm blown away by the, the work that you do, the work that you've done on yourself, how you've grown through the challenges that you've faced, and then how you're expanding that growth to everyone through the village well. It's really remarkable. And I really appreciate you being here and sharing all of it. We've had a lot of fun. And like I said, learned a lot as well along the way. And now is your final opportunity to make a resounding impression before you walk out that door. One of the legacies that we always honor here at Datages is the, the legacy of the bad dad joke. So can you share the best worst joke from the queer brown dad. Going to do a little twist on it and tell a funny dad story. So to set the context, this is early pandemic when we're all terrified. And also my kids are around me just too much and are picking up new language from me every day in my, you know, fear and frustration. And, and so I'm guessing it's not Tagala. <laughs> it's not Tagalog. No. Although I could teach them how to swear in Visayan, which is my family's dialect, because that's the only words I know in Visayan. So so I'm driving and my kids are in the back seat and we play the game I spy. You know I spy? Okay. So course, I say yeah. I spy with my little eye something white. And my three-year-old says, Is it the clouds? And I say, No. And he says, Well then what the hell is it? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, wow. Okay, so you're picking up language and your your work effort is not particularly good right now. So it's something to build over time. So that's my dadages bad dad joke story. All attitude, no follow through. I have no exactly. idea where you got that from. <laughs> <laughs> exactly right. Well, Ed, thank you again. This has been fantastic. Thank you for being a part of the Datages friends and family. And we look forward to staying in touch. I really appreciate you having me on today. And thank you for all the great work that you are doing with this podcast for fellow dads like me. Yeah. And you mentioned earlier your challenges as being an entrepreneur and contending with some of those things. Uh, we'd love to have you back for an episode of our Entrepreneur's Corner. Talk all about your experiences as an entrepreneur. Just this morning, I was thinking about your just show up with donuts. I really love donuts. And so I was like, okay, with all the school districts that I'm trying to get contracts from, whose office do I show up with? Uh, just do, whose office do I show up? Uh, what do I do? What kind of donuts? So I'm really excited to apply that framework. There you go. I'm glad I could help. <laughs> Thank you, Ed. Take care. Thank you so much. And to all of our listeners out there, remember, dad may not always know what he's talking about, but he sure can sound like he does.